This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. In the United States, there are over 95 million head of cattle, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And on average, Americans consume over 57 pounds of beef each year. But the known history of cattle stretches beyond the farms and cowboys of the Wild West, back into the arrival of Spanish colonists. Our guest today is Nicola Del Sol, a postdoctoral associate at the Florida Museum of Natural History. You may remember a previous episode when Dr. Del Sol joined us to talk about the discovery of a mysterious horse tooth that was uncovered while he was studying the introduction of cattle in the Americas. Thank you for joining us again. Hi, yeah, thank you for having me. Let's go back to the beginning. How did you first become interested in cattle? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, actually. I didn't grow up on a ranch, for example, or nothing related to cattle, actually, in my personal life. So, I mean, it's it's just really the history of my research that just led me to ask these kind of questions about cattle. Initially, I was doing some research on the introduction of European domesticates in the Americas, in Guatemala, for example. And just found out that there were lots of cattle. And other sites, you know, for example, Puerto Real in the island of Española, same thing. So it just got intriguing me. And I, as I was reading more about cattle ranching in the Americas and, and the introduction of cattle ranching during the colonial period, I just thought that there was a, a great topic to investigate there. Right. Room to learn, things to find out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before colonization, were there anything that we might consider cattle in the Americas? Or had they died off during the Pliocene or something like that? Because I know historically there was like similar creatures, but... Yeah, and well, so the closest thing that there was in the Americas to cattle were bisons, were, you know, buffaloes. They weren't domesticated. And then, you know, their their behavior is quite distinct from cattle. So there were no, no typically no equivalent to cattle, especially in these parts of the, of the early colonization of the continent, you know, the, in the Caribbean, for example... Uh, even in Mexico, I mean, I think bison already had disappeared uh, some time ago. It's quite different from the horse. We can say that horses returned with the Europeans. They returned to the American continent. In the, in the case of cattle, it's not the case. I mean, cattle were distant species which developed and evolved in Eurasia, then was brought to the American by the Europeans. What do we know about how the cattle arrived in the Americas, how early on in the colonization process did they arrive? The first cattle that we know were brought actually by Columbus himself in like 1493, 94 on his second voyage. He, he boarded cattle on one of his ships and just left them there in the Caribbean. Thinking about the sites that you're getting the samples from, how do those relate to our understanding of the islands and the Americas today? Yeah, so they were European towns, uh, mostly so, so centers of, of European and Spanish power, actually, where all the, you know, economic activities uh, were centralized. These were also places where you had, how can I say, highly culturally diverse because, uh, you know, there were like, you know, Spanish residents, colonizers, other Europeans also, but also significant native population in most of these sites. A bit later in the process, also enslaved uh, and free African descending workers. And more specifically, most of the, the cattle remains that, that I studied, they come from places where they were consumed. At the end of the process of the transformation of, of cattle, they were like basically kitchen refuse and, and waste and, and, and all of that. But indirectly, they also reflect all the, the life history of these animals. And, and in that case, also the ranching practices and, and also through DNA, the origins of the animals. Thinking about the DNA there, what kind of breeds or species were they bringing with them? With the type of DNA evidence that we had in that study specifically, we couldn't narrow it down as much as, you know, pinpointing a specific breed as we know it. Also, we have to put that in a broader historical perspective because breeds, the, all the, the domestic animals, breeds, like whether it's for cattle, horses, you know, even chicken, all these are categories, are varieties of animals that were standardized and formalized much later in history, like around the 19th century. It's kind of convenient to talk about breeds. Uh, we, we do it all the time, but it's, we have to consider that at the colonial period, it was anachronic to talk about breeds at that time. There were like some regional varieties. So the text of history called documents, what they mention, what we know is that apparently they were 
bringing, you know, mostly animals from southern Spain, because initially to save them the long journey through the Atlantic, the animals were actually boarded in the Canary Island on the western coast of Africa, a bit closer to the Caribbean. So it's it like a shorter journey. So actually the ships were sent from Cadiz in the southern Spain. Then they had a long stop in the Canary Island to kind of, you know, to have all the animals boarded, the food, the water, because it was a, a huge practical and logistical endeavor, you know, to bring all these persons and animals, you know, over like four or five weeks journey over the Atlantic. Our study is consistent with these uh, historical documents, but it adds that there were likely to be some introductions also so from cattle directly from Africa, which is something that was suspected through, you know, modern genetic studies and also from historical investigations. But we don't have actually any historical records that clearly states that these cows were boarded like in West Africa and brought to the America. So that that's kind of like the novelty a little bit of our study. If you look at too many kind of historic documents, it'd be more like two head of cattle. Like it wouldn't say anything mm-hmm. specific. That kind of yeah. information yeah. isn't usually in the recorded record. Getting into your study and getting samples, are these in, in museum collections? Like where are you getting the samples from that you're then testing? These studies was part of my doctoral investigation that I did at the Florida Museum of Natural History. There are like many collections from the Circum Caribbean area because, you know, researchers from the museum like have edited extensively in in that region. I also had a collection, the collection from Mexico City. I went down to Mexico City to sample these specimens with the huge help of a Mexican colleague from the the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia in Mexico City. All of these are collections that were excavated years ago and that, you know, are sitting in uh, museum or government collections, which shows, by the way, that you can always revisit older collections. I mean, you don't have always to, to go and excavate new stuff to, to find new things, you know. Uh, given the advances of archaeological sciences, you can also always you know, kind of revisit these old collections. Right. As new tools get developed, you have new things you can find out. Yeah. For example, I had one of the collections from uh, southern Mexico in, in uh, so Merida, in Yucatan. It was excavated in the late 50s. Long legs on history. <laughs> like it'll go on for Yeah. So what was the biggest surprise you found digging into the results of your DNA testing? So there were actually two. There was, these are like two main takeaways of, of our study. So the first is the historical documentation. Like these are older studies and made in the 70s and the 80s, saying that the Spanish, they brought fewer heads of cattle in the Caribbean. From there, you know, the population exploded. They were bred locally and then they were brought to the mainland, to Mexico and, and other regions. And like they constituted the base of the first herds of, of cattle. So that should have been seen in the genetic record of these ancient cattle should have been seen with a, a lower genetic diversity, especially over time, like maintaining kind of this isolation of the populations, which actually was not the case. I mean, our study shows, suggests that over time, we are seeing that the genetic diversity is increasing, which suggests that they were bringing, you know, from Europe, you know, the, the Europeans were you know, constantly bringing more cattle to kind of improve the genetic pool, I guess, of the herd. So that was the first interesting conclusion that we had. And the second conclusion that I was hinting at before in my response is that we're likely to have direct evidence of African cattle being brought directly to Mexico in the 17th century. I mean, that should be confirmed just like to be clear about that. You know, we, we, we always try to be nuanced about the, the conclusions that we take, you know. Right. We want to do make further analysis to kind of precise that and confirm that. But our evidence strongly suggests that we have direct introduction of African cattle, which didn't appear, like I said before, didn't appear in in any historical document. You kind of teased earlier, but I, I wanted to ask you about the cowboys and the cattle ranchers. Like most of us think of John Wayne or Clint Eastwood or things like the Yellowstone TV series that are now. What were the actual people who were doing the ranching like compared to what we think of? That's a great question. And that's really something that I really care about. And that, you know, I I really found while doing this research, research more generally my, my PhD, 
something that I didn't suspect is that the early cowboys, the vaqueros in Mexico and even in the Caribbean, and, and it's not only our study that shows that. I mean, our study is kind of like brings new evidence to that narrative that most of them were of African origins. We have, you know, records of the ranchers, the, 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 the breeders, like people who are actually interacting with cattle on the large Spanish haciendas in, in Mexico, for example. Most of them, I mean, we have their demographics, for example, and, and their origins, and their names, and most of them were what they call mulatos, people who have like a partial African descent or directly brought from Africa. And what's more, even more interesting is that, you know, all of this, I, I learned it through the works of Andrew Slater, who's a, a historical geographer at LSU, who has been working extensively on that topic, on the history of blacks in, in the ranching industry in the Americas, that many of them were coming from, you know, the first wave of deportation of African persons from Africa to the Americas came from West Africa. And in that region, for example, you have communities that, like the Fulani people who have lived like for, for centuries, a lifestyle, very close relation with cattle. I mean, they are, they, this is a typically a herder society. In my mind, it's likely that they were also being brought for their knowledge of cattle, especially, uh, you know, cattle ranching in tropical environments. To come back to your question, it's kind of remotely related to the traditional narrative and the image, the image we have all from, you know, from Hollywood and, and the Westerns, this kind of whitewashing of the cowboys, to state it simply, is the first cowboys in the Americas were actually black, didn't look remotely like Clint Eastwood or Kevin Cosner, you know? <laughs> so that was a very fascinating finding, actually, in my investigation. So that, that's really something that I found very interesting. Switching over topics a little bit, you worked on this research during your doctoral. Yeah, that's right. Can you talk a little bit about the NSF funding? I think you specifically got something we call a doctoral dissertation improvement award. So talk through your experience getting the award and kind of what impact it had on the work. So yeah, you're right. I, I got a, um, a doctoral dissertation improvement award to do this research. To say it simply, I think all of the work, for example, that's been published here in scientific reports or even like my, my earlier article in Plus One, uh, and nothing would have been possible without in the help of, of the NSF. Because, I mean, especially when you're doing ancient DNA, these are studies that cost money. I mean, not only the, the analysis, but also, you know, traveling. And it's been like quite, quite important for this research. I mean, it's something that I had like talked about with my advisor, like from the start, you know, because I, I knew that I would have to travel and like research that could cost money. And, you know, eventually gathered the, the documentation. I worked on an application and, and, and I got it. I mean, it's a significant amount of work, especially when you're a doctoral student and you have like lots of other things. And it's also worth it, I think, as a uh, just considering it like from a, a scholarly point of view, it's, it's a great way to kind of summarize your research, what your research questions are. I mean, for me, it was also useful in, in my own growth as a researcher to learn how to do research and how to present it to a funding agency, you know, to so show why it's important. Why should the U.S. government fund my research, for example? It's, that's a quite basic question, but an important one. Earlier, you mentioned having to go to Mexico and collaborating with researchers there. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like collaborating with people from other countries or far off locations? I've been working uh, in Latin America and particularly Central America and Mexico for some years now. So, I mean, I, you know, I love doing research in these countries, I, I, but I think what's very important is like and that has guided me in my research is like really considering your, you know, my Mexican colleagues are collaborators and like getting them involved in the research, whether like it's through public talks or like associating them with publications and, and stuff like that. I mean, what's also critical and like, you know, if I had to give some advice to someone, a student, for example, to work there is the importance of the language. I'm fluent in Spanish. But it's critical to really be fluent in, in Spanish, in my mind, because it makes relations even easier to understand better how the system works. And so it's even easier, you know, to comply with all the rules and regulations, for example, because I had to export samples. So it's just to add on that is that, you know, uh, in 
many Latin American countries. Most of the archaeology that has been done in past decades, uh, you know, is kind of tainted with some sort of neocolonialism, you know. So for, to me, it's important to really respect all the rules and regulation and like comply with them and, and treat your Mexican colleagues as, as equals. I mean, that's that's fundamental to me. The last question I had for you is what's next? Is there more work to be done with cattle or are you moving on to something else? Yes, yes and no. I would love to, you know, do more analysis on the same samples, you know, to kind of expand, for example, and analyze like other parts of the DNA that would yield maybe more information of the samples. But uh, for now, keeping on publishing some of the, the research I did during my PhD, but starting in January, I'm going to still work on cattle, but in another region, I'm, I'm moving to, to Canada, actually, to Quebec. To kind of reproduce the same approach as I did in the Caribbean, but this time on the early colonial cattle brought by the French, trying to, you know, find where they came from. Also their breeding history, you know, because there are like some interesting interactions between the French and the, the British in this area and use the cows as kind of a proxy to also analyze these relationships. Special thanks to Nicola Del Sol. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.